Welcome to Lesson 13 of East Main 101. I am your facilitator of City of Jackson, Tennessee Communications Director Kenneth Cummings. And today, for Lesson 13, we have Jackson Police Department Chief Tom Corley. Chief Corley, thank you for coming in for East Main. Right, thanks for having me. 101, Lesson 13. Looking forward to talking about a lot of things with Jackson Police Department. We'll start off by reading the bio of Chief Corley. Chief Corley became the Chief of Police for Jackson, Tennessee in January of 2022, January 3rd. 2022. He has been employed with the Jackson Police Department for over three decades, beginning his law enforcement career in 1990 as a patrol officer assigned to the patrol division. Within the department, he has served as a narcotics investigator, background investigator, internal affairs investigator, hostage negotiator, use of force instructor, and legal instructor. He is promoted to the rank of sergeant in the patrol division in 1997. And he later became the patrol shift commander upon his promotion to lieutenant in 20, 2008. It was during his time as a patrol division supervisor that Chief Corley attended law school, graduating in 2008. Chief Corley was promoted to captain in 2009, assuming the role of department legal advisor at the time, and then the rank of major in 2013. Serving as general counsel for the police chief, and command staff, Chief Corley provided legal guidance and training for all department employees with regard to their duties as law enforcement officers. In addition, Chief Corley participated in other legal matters such as city ordinance development, litigation defense, vendor contract reviews, and liaison with the district attorney and city attorney. In September of 2019, he was promoted to assistant chief of police. Chief Corley is a lifelong resident of Jackson, Tennessee, and graduated in 1986 from Jackson Central Mary High School. Go Cougars. Go Cougars. Chief Corley then served in the United States Marine Corps prior to becoming a Jackson Police Department officer. He later graduated from Bethel University with attaining a bachelor's degree of science, a bachelor of science degree in management in 1999. After attending Nashville School of Law, Chief Corley received his Doctorate of Jurisprudence in 2008. He's a member of the Tennessee Bar and a licensed and practicing attorney. Chief Corley and his wife, Jamie, have two adult children, a son and a daughter. In addition to his duties as Jackson Police Department, Chief Corley serves as adjunct faculty for Bethel University's College of Professional Services, teaching courses in criminal justice. Chief Corley, lengthy bio. <laughs> I have a police chief and a lawyer. Right. An acting attorney, that's something you don't hear right. about often in the police world. No, there's not, not many of us around. So as an attorney, um, I, I, we're going to get right into it. Um, whenever we have new recruits, and I've attended a few of their uh, swearing-in ceremonies, uh, you have this, this speech that you give about the three C's and the four F's. Mm -hmm. And the first time I attended a swearing-in ceremony and I listened to you say it, I was like, ah, oh, it's you know, it is what it is. But then the next time I attended I listened and I heard all the things and those the three C's, community policing, collaborative policing, constitutional policing, and those four F's, having faith, relying on family, fitness, and fun. Um, those things to me, I mean, when I hear them, I get goosebumps and chills on, wow, our police department is, is really hearing from, first of all, an attorney who wants to do right by them and for our citizens here in the city of Jackson. So going more in depth into those, uh, we're going to talk about the three C's and the four F's. So the first C, again, community. How important and why is community policing important? It, it's, um, it's huge. Uh, partnering with the community has to happen uh, in a law enforcement agency. You really can't do this job without having that connection with the community. Uh, even if the officers don't live in this city and they come here to work, they, this is the community they're serving. They have to be engaged with the community. So it's, it's critical. It's community policing. I mean, it, as you say, it's, it's a critical thing because they are, again, a part of the community, not mm -hmm. just as police officers, but citizens who live here. Right. They are a community as well. So collaborative policing, uh, I know that JPD collaborates with the Sheriff's Department and TBI and other agencies, but mm -hmm. why is it important for collaborative with, again, the community part of police? Right. So it's a team effort, uh, internally and externally. Uh, we do partner with a lot of federal and state and uh, other agencies. The, you mentioned the Sheriff's Department. We're, we're partnering with them daily. Um, but we have to partner with the community. Uh, we have to 
to engage in them. And so like the camera registry program where we, we, we provide a conduit for them to help reduce crime in their neighborhood by registering their cameras. Uh, neighborhood watch associations, you know, participating in National Night Out. We, we, we provide those opportunities so we can connect and work together. And, and you mentioned that camera registry, and we'll get more into it, but you say how the public can actually be a part of helping out JPD. And we'll get more into that because I, when we first launched that camera registry, I was excited about it, right. to, uh, where the public can be a part of helping solve crimes without right. having to actually go down to police departments. Right. Uh, and the, the last C, the constitutional policing, you don't hear that a lot. Um, you don't hear it being... W let me rephrase it. The public doesn't hear that being told to the officers. Uh, you say it to every new recruit that comes in. Talk about why constitutional policing is important. Well, uh, obviously, I think everyone has seen over the last several years uh, instances across the country where law enforcement officers have not done the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that perception goes you know, hits every law enforcement agency when something like that happens. What we want to do from day one is to is to have the recruit officers understand that we're going to train them, and we're going to lead them, and we're going to put them in position to do their job the right way every time. And so, uh, constitutional policing just means basically that they're protecting those rights of everyone. And when you say everyone, that includes you say in your speech you say victim, um, suspect, and witness. Right. Every, every one of those people have the same exact right. Yeah, they, everyone has those constitutional rights. And it's not enough that we just kind of dance around those rights and make sure that we don't violate them. In reality, we're the guardians of those rights. We're the ones to make sure that those rights are protected. And, and that's an amazing thing to hear coming from the police chief telling each of the new recruits. And those officers are reminded every time they're coming there. It's not just for the recruits. Mm -hmm. It's for every officer who's That's right. under uh, your watch as chief of police. Absolutely. So the three C's, community policing, collaborative policing, constitutional policing, very important aspects and very important keys for good officers here in the city. And we have some of the best officers in the city of Jackson. I'll have to agree with you. 100%. Um, and the four Fs, faith, family, fitness, and fun. Um, mm -hmm. That's another part of your speech that you give. And uh, when it comes to faith, uh, one thing that I love hearing you say that um, it's, as a Christian myself, but you, you let officers know whatever faith it is that you lean on to that faith. Mm -hmm. Talk about why you say that to them and uh, what the faith aspect is and why it's important. Right. So uh, over 30 years of, of being in law enforcement, there has been many, many times that I've, I've had to, I've needed to mm -hmm. lean on my faith. And I know that there's times that, that I probably wouldn't have made it through what I was going through without my faith. And so from a personal perspective, I, I kind of, you know, I want to say that to each one of them that, uh, that I, I know, uh, personally know, that leaning on your faith is going to be a, a, a critical thing that you do in this profession. So uh, as a Christian myself, again, that is something I think uh, they need to hear. Um, the other part of it is that, you know, uh, faith, I mean, we all, like you said, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. it, that does not, to me, it's not important um, that you express your faith to me. What's important to me is that you understand from my perspective uh, as a leader that I, I want you to know that you can and you should lean on your faith in this job. And, and to hear that, to know that we have, we have a multitude of uh, officers, black, white, um, Hispanic, we have different faiths, different religions. Right. And to hear you say lean on that faith that you have and not necessarily pressuring them to lean on whatever it is and like you said you're not telling them to express it to them but lean on what it is right. that keeps you grounded right. um in so that you can be able to come to work i mean jpd police officers across the board it's a hard job it is it's a tough job so um as a person who leans on faith myself i mean just i'm not a police officer just day to day mm -hmm. i have to lean on my faith mm -hmm. just waking up in the morning um and one of the, the next F, family. 
Uh, talk about why family is important to all the officers at JPD. Well, it, it's important uh, because uh, they're going to need their support. Uh, they're going to need their family support. And and when I when I when I discuss this in front of the recruit officers before we swear them in, uh, I talked for a, a brief moment to the families, and 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 tell them that their officer is going to need them. Uh, but then I talked to the officers as well because from personal experience, there's been times when. Uh, I didn't want to take something home and share that with my family because I was I, I was trying to protect them, mm-hmm. and and that's a natural uh, feeling and a natural thing to do, um, but I think bottling that up and not sharing that uh, causes the wrong kind of dynamic with family. Mm-hmm. Um, that that shows that maybe you don't trust them or or, or, or someone may have that perception. So we're going to need them to release that. Mm. some of that stress by sharing that with their family, but we're also going to need the family to be there in support. So it's a two-way street. And that's another thing that I love that you do. You actually, before the recruits are sworn in, you talk to their families. And right. just because, again, the officers are part of this community, and their families are just as a part of the community as right. they are. Um, it, it just so happens that their son or their daughter, their niece, their nephew, their grandchild is a police officer right. for the city. So leaning on family, it's it's almost like therapy, man. Uh, it's it's an important thing, and for those mm-hmm. who don't necessarily have family, there are people that they can rely on right. that you can call family. Right. Occasionally, we'll we'll have uh, a recruit officer that doesn't have family present there. That I'm, and I'm saying, well, it doesn't matter. You're part of our family now, mm-hmm. and so you have family. Instant. Yeah. Family. yeah. Um, so after that, the next F, fitness. Um, I go to the gym in the mornings, um, and I know there. are officer out here who are working out um, mm-hmm. talk about the importance of fitness is it, is it just a physical fitness or is it all around type of fitness? It, it's it's more than that now obviously uh the expectation is that our officers maintain a physical fitness level uh that's going to be needed because sadly there's going to be instances where they're going to have to use physical abilities um but it, it's more than that it's also emotional fitness it's mental fitness mm-hmm. and so um we particularly over the last few years, have been very uh, intentional about providing uh, different things and different um, ways that officers can uh, work on their mental fitness and their emotional fitness. Uh, through the risk management department has been so great working with us um, to, to provide those things that will help officers. You know, officers oftentimes suffer from PTSD and other stress-related uh, types of things because of the, the, the things that they see. And so uh, we need them to be able to be prepared for the next shift. And they've got to be able to be able to uh, work through that in some way. And so mental and emotional fitness is just as important as physical fitness. And I 100% agree because if, if your mind's not right, right. Um, it's probably hard to get out of the bed. That's or right. if you get out of the bed, your mind's not right. It'll be hard to see a car wreck the next day or a, a gunshot victim. Um, so that fitness part, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, all of those. There's, there's, you know, people may not understand this uh, look outside looking in, but what we see is officers that will go to that wreck mm-hmm. with, with bad injuries or, or fatality. The next call is dealing with a domestic violent situation and then 30 minutes later Mm -hmm. they're dealing with uh maybe a runaway child and and taking the emotions from one to the next to the next and then bottling all that up at the end of the day that that's that's a tough thing that's definitely a tough thing um and that that fitness part that relies heavily on family because you see all three of those things those examples and if you keep it bottled up don't talk to anybody I mean, it, it'll crush you from the inside out. Absolutely. Um, and for those who do lean on faith, to have that spiritual guidance, whatever it is, um, to be able to release it that way as well. Um, good, Three good things. And then that fourth one, fun. Mm-hmm. You don't hear, oh, police officers, why are they having fun? They're supposed to be, you know, solving crimes, things like that. Why is fun a part of this? And why is it so important? Right. So... When we discuss fun at, at the swearing ends, and, and what I mean by that is uh, two different things. I, I want the, everyone that works at the Jackson Police Department, our support staff, our officers, everyone, I want them to look forward to coming to work. I don't want them to dread coming to work. 
Uh, so it, the environment at the Jackson Police Department and our culture needs to be one of family. We're, we're family. We're going to take care of each other. And that, you know, we're going to enjoy the work that we do. Mm. Uh, you know, just like you said, getting up in the morning sometimes, it's a struggle at, to get to work. And if it, you're dreading coming to work, then you're not probably going to have a good day that yeah. day. And so and to the, to the extent we can, our officers need to have a good day every day. And so that's part of it. And the other part of it is having something outside mm -hmm. of work that you enjoy. Uh, you mentioned fitness. I also work out every day and go running. And, and that, that having something that you enjoy doing outside to lower that stress level is, is needed. So I want them to enjoy outside of work, but I want them to, to enjoy coming to work. The three C's, four F's, community policing, collaborative policing, constitutional policing, and relying on faith, family, fitness, and having fun. Um, and speaking of the fun, I, I go to some of these events, or I see some on social media, I see the smiles of the officers. And that's a positive thing, that right. officers have high morale in coming to work. Um, and to be in a city as safe as we are, because I, I can say that we're safe, um, because I believe it. I can walk around downtown, and I'm, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, to see the, the joy that our officers have, um, it makes them, again, want to come to work. Right. And speaking of the safety of the city, we are, in my humble opinion, are a safe city, especially with some, a lot of the technology that we have. Um, and you mentioned earlier the, the, the camera registry, and we'll get into that. But um, two of the biggest pieces of technology that I've been a part of, the camera registry and the fly cameras. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about the camera registry first. Um, I've been to JPD headquarters. And I've seen the big board with the screens that our officers are watching. Um, we have blue light cameras, mm -hmm. and we also have cameras that citizens and businesses, they can provide JPD with some of the footage. Um, mm -hmm. Explain why this camera registry is so important for the safety of the city. Right. So, again, it's a, it's a way for the citizens of the city and uh, the business owners to play a part in crime prevention or at least uh, maybe solving a crime that may have happened. And so um, what the registry program does is you really just provide us a list of where cameras are located, external facing cameras. Mm. And so maybe it's a doorbell type camera that, that a resident might have. Maybe it's a security camera on the side of a building. But knowing where those cameras are and provides us. So if we do have an incident that happens in that general location, what that registry does is provide us either a phone number or an email address that we can send a message, say, hey, you know, we, we may have had a car burglary down the street from you. Mm. If you've got footage from this time to this time on this date, can you upload it to us so we can look and maybe see a suspect? And we've solved so many crimes that way. Mm. And so, it's a, it's, again, it's a way to us to collaborate with the citizens uh, to, to prevent crime or to reduce crime. And so that's how that system works. So we, don't get to, we can't see your camera footage. Okay. Only if you send it to us okay. like that. So, so JPD is not tapped into my no. rain camera. No, no, can't but, do it. So for instance, if if a neighborhood association or street, they all get together and let's say they all have cameras. Mm -hmm. If something happens to, and they all let's say they all sign up for this registry. If something happens at one two three G Street, mm -hmm. and the that's a dead end, and that's at the end of the route, uh, and other homes that are signed up to it, all of them can provide footage, and you can possibly see a suspect's car in every camera, and somebody will right. probably see their face. Somebody will probably see their license plate. Right, right. So, we might get a license plate. We'll get a good description of the vehicle, or maybe the person driving it, or who walked to the car to get into it if they actually committed an offense. And so we can get a clothing description. And so all those things can come from that. And all it comes from is just registering your, your camera. And again, it's not JPD tapped into. Right. It's we, right. a person providing that information. Right. So if everybody in the city and every business decided to sign up who has a camera or a ring or whatever type of camera they have, if everybody decided to sign up for this registry, this whole city could be, like Iron Man said, like a, a, a a suit of armor around the city. <laughs> well, in a way. In a right, way. Right, right. We absolutely would have some more tools to prevent crime. That's that's an amazing thing. So, again, we're not we're not spying on anybody. No, we can't see, we can't, we can't see them. We can't see anything unless mm -hmm. you provide that information. Right. So, 
I highly suggest signing up for that registry for mm-hmm. anyone who wants to. And uh, you can sign up at police.jacksontn.gov, and we'll mm-hmm. put the link down later on. Um, and another one of the pieces of technology we have that's kind of on a national level is the flock cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it's the little red light blinking cameras that right. are around. Um, but th- explain how important those are and what they do for our city. Right. So those are uh, what we call LPR cameras, license plate reader cameras. And so uh, what they're doing is is when a vehicle passes by one of those, the, the red light that you see is a sensor that picks up that there's movement and it takes a snapshot of the license plate. And also gets a description of the vehicle. I mean, the you know, can see the, you know, it's white truck. Mm-hmm. So it does that. Well, uh, that information is compared against a, a national database. So say the Jackson Police Department is looking for uh, a burglary suspect and we have a vehicle description and tag number. We can enter that into the system. If that vehicle traveled to Kentucky and a city up there had the flock system, it's going to pop. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to alert to the officers and to the dispatch center so that that vehicle just drove past that camera, and they can make an arrest even if, if it's out of state wow. because that, that, that database is shared. Okay. okay. And so we, the first day, first 24-hour period that we had those cameras in our city, uh, we had an alert downtown mm-hmm. um, going south on Highland, and uh, – we ended up stopping that vehicle. That alert was for a homicide suspect out of the Chicago area, and that suspect was inside that vehicle. So we, we actually made it a, a homicide arrest the first 24 hours. You know, it was from another jurisdiction, but that's how that system works and how effective it is. It's a game changer. I mean, a whole another jurisdiction, a whole other state. Oh, right. Um, Absolutely. That's, a, first of all, a long drive. Um, <laughs> right. I've got family, for sure. a lot of people right. have family in Chicago. But to be able to catch them here in Jackson – just by this camera system that's attached right. to a national registry. Right. They they weren't stopping here. They were driving through 45 South, heading somewhere else. But they weren't even stopping. They were just they were just driving them through. And, and we caught them here in Jackson. We caught them. Mm-hmm. Uh, first 24 hours of that's setting right. up one of them. Mm-hmm. Amazing system. Amazing piece of technology. Right. Uh, another one of the piece that keeps the city safe. Um, not just our city. It keeps other cities, other jurisdictions right. who use this safe because we're catching them right. here. And so. Uh, I may talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of the folks that we deal with on the criminal side of the house where we're arresting them, they don't, they're not from here, mm. but uh, maybe Memphis or some other city, we've, mm. but that same system, we've, we've solved cases from here where they've arrested, been arrested in other cities or we've, we've arrested uh, suspects from other cities because of that system. Coming through Jackson, if, right. if you are – Wanted, you're more than likely will get caught if you That's pass. Right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so another, and I can't believe I forgot about this one because this one has been around, um, I think, since I've worked for the Jackson Sun. Um, Shot Spotter. Right. It's an amazing piece of technology right. for you all. Talk about Shot Spotter for a little bit. Right. So Shot Spotter is a is a gunfire detection system, and basically it uses like triangulation. But there's sensors that are mounted uh, throughout the city. And uh, if uh, in those areas, if, if gunfire goes off, then uh, that's detected by the system and it sends an alert to our officers and the dispatch immediately. So real time, um, I've got an app on my phone. It'll alert me and I can see where uh, the, the gunfire was detected. It, it puts us within about an 80 foot mm. uh, mm. diameter of okay. where, it, where it occurred and um, I can listen to the audio. I can tell whether it was semi-automatic fire, whether, yeah. you know. And so that information gets fed to the officers immediately, and they go there. And um, uh, we, you know, we've solved many cases through ShotSpotter and, and the combination of ShotSpotter, maybe Flock. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll get to the scene sometimes, and somebody will give a suspect description, say, hey, this vehicle came by, I heard shots, and this was the vehicle I heard. We enter that into Flock, and we'll stop it somewhere else in town and recover the gun and wow. Uh, make an arrest. And so it, it is a, it's a vital piece of technology that we use. And there's, there are certain locations in the city that shot mm-hmm. spires are. So it's not necessarily. So you say you can detect whether it's a semi-automatic, automatic, whatever type of right. gun. Can it determine if it's a firework or a car that's. Right. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get alerts sometimes and it'll say probable gunfire mm-hmm. or probable fireworks because of the level uh, of, the, of detection. 
And so, and we have gone, particularly during the 4th of July uh, time frame, we'll get, we'll get a lot of fireworks type calls through ShotSpotter because it'll, it'll alert to that. And then you have um, another, these are, these are just coming up, the blue light cameras that we mm -hmm. have across, of course, uh, I see them mainly around schools and uh, probably some of the parks, but those blue light cameras, uh, how important and what makes those very useful for this? Jackson. They're, they're very useful. So the blue light cameras are uh, pan, tilt, zoom type cameras. They're very high definition cameras. And so uh, you, you spoke earlier about being at the department and seeing the, the, the yes. command room there with the, with the video monitors. Well, well, those are staff with retired officers that work part time. They come in because and, and we use retired officers because they know what they're looking at mm -hmm. and they can see uh, through those cameras. Well, that's suspicious activity or that that's a gun or that's a possible uh, drug transaction going on. And so uh, we do have them in various parts of the city. All the schools uh, in the city uh, have at least one. Uh, some of the larger uh, campuses may have two, uh, but they're, they're there. We do have them at some of the parks, and we, ha we have the flock cameras at the entrance to mm -hmm. every, every park. Um, so that camera technology, again, has been a game changer for us because it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's not Big Brother looking at you, but it is monitoring uh, those areas. And a lot of the areas where the blue light cameras are, particularly when we first started that program, it was under a grant, and it had to be data-driven where we were having robberies or burglaries or whatever. And so uh, that's where they originally were, and then that, that has expanded to other areas where we've seen some higher activity, and uh, we want to lower that activity. So. We don't mind putting the blue light on. We won't let you know that it's the police, yeah. that, that those cameras are for the police. And sometimes there's a perception of blue lights are in my area. It's like my area is not safe. Personally, right. I'd rather have a blue light because right. I know, JPD, in that command center, you're watching. I mean, the, right. the TV's huge. The coat crawl almost the size of the studio. Right. You can see everything. Yeah. And so, no, it's not just because there might be a crime problem there. Maybe it's because we put them in front of the schools. That's a safety. That's a preventative mm -hmm. thing. And we'll we'll do those too. Um, and if or you know we see there's an area where there's going to be a high population area, shopping areas or whatever. That's a preventative thing. That blue mm -hmm. light camera there is hopefully a deterrent to car burglars or yeah. something like that. So it's not. Uh, purely fueled by there's been a lot of problems here. Mm -hmm. We're trying to reduce stuff. So when when the, the blue light cameras kind of first started here, uh, when I worked for The Sun, I learned about them. Um, one thing I personally say is I've seen and heard officers prior to you becoming chief where um, neighborhoods or complexes that have these blue light cameras, I think one of the officers said that he now sees children playing outside more because – they know JPD is watching and they're safe if something right. happens. Have you seen that impact with those blue light cameras? Right, yes. I've, I've heard uh, business owners say, hey, love that we've got a blue light camera uh, around the corner from our you know, business. Or, and, and we have, uh, particularly in some of the uh, apartment complexes and things where they're nearby, that does provide some, some perception and sense of safety, and that's, that's a good thing. A sense of safety is it, it's a good it is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, if I could, we got blue light cameras everywhere. <laughs> I personally, again, don't think if I'm not doing anything wrong, I'm going to shop. I see a blue light. I feel like you know that again. It's it's almost a preventative method mm -hmm. of if somebody were to break into my car, that blue light can more than likely catch them. And, again, I've seen those cameras when they first were implemented. One of the cameras located, I think, at the bypass in either Old Hickory or I think it's Old Hickory. Uh, one of the officers who's at the table at the command center, he zoomed in all the way to the gas pump across the street. Mm -hmm. So the camera is on one, end, on one side of mm -hmm. Old Hickory. It zoomed in onto that corner gas station. Right. I mean, it's high quality. Yeah, right, right. You can see the face. You can almost see how much they were paying for their gas. <laughs> right. But our officers, they're not necessarily doing that. They're just watching to make sure. Right. They're, they're monitoring them, and they'll move them around. And then if we get a call in an area there, that, that officer that's at the camera room can move that camera mm. to where that call is and help provide support to those officers saying this is what they see before they get there. That's amazing. Um, there's one other thing, and we'll, we'll get into this at another point where you're at home. We'll talk more about the safety in the schools and how they're connected. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that on an, another lesson uh, with 
JPD Chief Corley. Um, so all of this, every piece of this is tied into community policing. Mm -hmm. Police is not just we're going to go out here and arrest somebody. Policing is not we're going to go out here and kick in the door. Policing is not just we're trying to get this hostage negotiation. Policing is community. And I want to give a big shout out to Stephanie Graham, mm -hmm. who runs the social media page. Um, she's connected in this community. Oh, absolutely. Um, she's out and she goes to get photos of our officers. And these photos aren't staged. The photos that I see on our police department's social media pages are genuine. The, the students and the kids who are with these officers, they're genuine. Mm -hmm. They're happy. Uh, recently I saw that you read it, uh, Mother Liberty. Yes. And the kids were just genuinely happy to be around the police chief. Um, personally, I, I'm grateful for that in the city of Jackson, Tennessee, what you've done, um, and what previous chiefs have done. But being that I've worked with you mm -hmm. to see what you have done with Jackson Police Department and the officers, the morale, um, community policing, let's get more into that. Why do you think that community policing is just as important as catching the bad guy? Um, I think some of it goes back to the sense of safety. Um, but when it, get, when it gets down to it, um, we are part of the community. And, you know, and so that officer that works that particular area of town from this shift, this particular hour to this particular hour, it's very important for him to know, he or she to know what, what's, what's correct and normal for that mm. area and what's out of place. Mm. And he, that, that officer can't do that until he gets engaged into that community. And so uh, there's a school in that district. Does he know that principal? Does the principal know who that officer is? Uh, there's a church in that district. Does that officer know that pastor? Does the pastor know who she is as an officer that, you know, that they can connect and work together on things? They, th that community engagement needs to happen. Uh, so because um, I, I read through the, the, uh, the 21st century guide to policing that the, the commission came out with uh, mm -hmm. uh, during uh, President Obama's administration and said that, that folks uh, – will allow, if you will, someone to govern them or have authority over them if they trust them. Mm. If they trust them, yeah. that they're going to do the job right. And so that goes back to the constitutional policing, but in community policing, they've got to have that trust. And how are they going to trust that officer if they don't know them? Mm. How do you trust anybody if you don't know them? So they've, they've, that engagement has to happen. And, and one of the officers who's kind of key in that is Officer Kozar. Yep. Um, He's out. He'll tell me to say oh, Sergeant Kozar. Sergeant Kozar. <laughs> if you're watching, Sergeant Kozar, Sergeant Kozar, Sergeant Patrick Kozar. He, if you know him, if you see him, right. Sergeant Kozar is out there. The kids, the students, the children, they love, they love him. them. Some Sergeant Kozar. That's right. And he, in turn, loves these students, right. these children. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about it all the time, mm -hmm. and when I talk to him about it, he's just he's just so animated in when he goes to the schools or when he goes out in the community, I see him. I see mm -hmm. him engaging. He's Sergeant Kozart, but at the time, he's he's Patrick. Right, you know? right. And uh, the, the students, the kids, the children, they know that he's a police officer, but they see him just as a, a, a black man. And I say that specifically because in this community, it's the trust is kind of tough. Right. But they see him, a black man who's an officer, but – he shows compassion to these mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. um, talk about his role and what he does as far as the kind of the community officer. Right. So uh, I'm going to age myself a little bit, but it takes me back to the officer-friendly days mm. uh, back in the 70s and the yeah. 80s. But that's what he does. Uh, again, we talked about trust, and, and you mentioned that. He goes into the schools – uh, and he, he talks to these kids, and he gets that trust level. And once he's got that trust level, they're going to listen to him. Mm -hmm. And then he engages them in the, the drug resistance uh, things, that we the, the, the curriculum and the, the LEAD program that we're, we're rolling out this year. Uh, but he can't do it. Again, just like the officer in the district, they can't really do that job 
the way they need to unless they have that trust. And so that's what he's doing, and that is so vitally important. Um, we've got a, across the country, juvenile crime is, is up. Yeah. Uh, juvenile violent crime particularly is up. Um, and for us to reach children early and hopefully divert them away from that, that's, that's part of the goal, and that's his mission, uh, and he's great at it. And, and he's talked to me about, and I've asked him before, it's like, do you have any students that have grown up with you? He tells me, yes. These, when they meet them early, and when he mm-hmm. meets them early mm-hmm. at a stage where they can, they understand, they go all the way through and remember him as mm-hmm. um, at the, Pat, Cozart, Sergeant Cozart, however they call him or whatever he wants them to call him. They remember him, and right. they will tell him, I remember when you came to my school That's in right. third grade. That's right. To talk about it. You know, last week we had the Youth Police Academy that he and Stephanie mm-hmm. uh, basically put on for, for some from kids that come through the Youth Police Academy, and, and he told me one of those those kids was middle schoolers, but one of those kids was a kid he had at Arlington Elementary School, wow. and they, they called him out. And so, hey, Cozart. So, uh, they, yeah, they get to know him, and uh, and, and, and he, just, he just is such a great asset. And like I said, they – you can't trust unless you get to know, and you mm-hmm. don't get to know unless you get in the thick of it. That's into right. the, go to the church, go to the neighborhood, mm-hmm. meet the matriarchs and the patriarchs mm-hmm. of this neighborhood who can tell you that car is not supposed That's to be right. here, That's or right. you know that bike has been here for too long, or you know I don't see the kids coming out as much. Something's happening. That's absolutely right. Uh, so the community policing part of JPD. Chief, it's it's an amazing thing to be a part of a city where the community is the top priority for our police department. Mm-hmm. And for you being um, an attorney who understands the law and wanting to protect everybody, whether you did the crime or you witnessed the crime or you're the victim of the crime, JPD is going to protect your rights. Mm-hmm. Um, and personally, as someone who's... 38, 30, how old am I? 38 <laughs> years old. I'm grateful to be in the city. You know, there are other cities, but I live in Jackson, Tennessee. I'm grateful to be in a city where our police department, I am proud to say, is the best police department in the state of Tennessee. Thank you. I appreciate uh, Mayor that. says it. You say right. it. Uh, the morale of the officers, um, I'm safe when I see them. Mm-hmm. I don't cringe when there's a, if I'm speeding, then yeah. <laughs> But if I'm not doing anything wrong, mm-hmm. I feel like our police officers are like they're they're not looking to do anything that's wrong to me. Right. Um, and that's a testament to the leadership of JPD. So, thank you. Chief Corley, thank you. Uh, and when you come on again, we'll get more in depth on maybe some numbers of statistics and things like sure. that. But right now, I just wanted to hear you talk about the community aspect and how mm-hmm. our officers are are doing and faring at JPD. So thank you for coming on the East Main Absolutely. Lesson Enjoy. 13. Um, so as you know, it's East Main 101. It's education. So we have a pop quiz. Okay. Chief Corley, pop quiz is just three questions that we get to know uh, about my guest. So pop quiz question number one, what's one piece of advice outside of the three C's and the four F's that you would give someone wanting to join JPD? Uh, my advice would be that first and foremost, that this doesn't need to be you're, you're coming here for a job. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you speak to just about anybody down at the police department, it, uh, law enforcement is a calling. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know Deputy Chief Tisdale will, will talk to he, as as a pastor, you know, yeah. he will say both of, of his, his occupations are a calling, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, and that's very true. Uh, if, if you're doing it, for a paycheck, which we, we don't make a lot of money, but if you're doing it just just for the you're in it for the wrong reason. So I, you know, I think the thing it is, it needs to be a, a committed mm. calling that you're you're there to serve. You you mentioned don't make a lot of money, but I will say that in these past few years, JPD where we are now is much better. Yes, I'm gonna say that. Yes, yes. Um, so. Shout out to this administration for knowing the importance of our police officers. Um, Absolutely. So question number two, pop quiz question number two, Mm -hmm. we're going back to the three C's and the four F's. I can't believe I'm remembering the three C's, four F's. (laughs) Um, Fun is one of the F's uh, topics that you have. So 
for you as police chief, you know, you see a lot, you read a lot, you know what's going on with your department. What is your outside work fun? Um, probably a lot like you. I'm at the gym every morning uh, so I can be consistent, but I enjoy that, and that kind of starts my day on a clean slate. And uh, I enjoy running. Uh, that kind of sounds silly that I enjoy running, but I enjoy running. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually uh, trained some earlier this year and, and completed a half marathon for the first time. So I just I enjoy doing that. But that that kind of is it's freeing to me mm-hmm. a little bit. And so I enjoy that. And it kind of it t- really takes the stress level off. And um, during these hot days, uh, yeah. you'll find me in the pool. That's what you the pool. <laughs> be hey, the pool. I'm all for that. <laughs> Uh, I love I love going to the beach. Um, mm-hmm. That's me and my wife. We enjoy going, just being in the sand, being in the water. Absolutely. Um, so I totally understand that. Um, so pop quiz question number three. We're gonna kind of go into family a little bit. You okay. mentioned in your bio that you have t- uh, a son and a daughter. So mm-hmm. with the son and daughter, do you have grandkids? I have one grandson one currently. Grandson. He's, he just turned two. Okay. Two, two. And I've got a granddaughter on the way. A granddaughter on due the way. in a at the end of the month. Oh, that's that's awesome. So, um, as a granddad mm-hmm. for your two year old, and um, you already had the experience as a first granddad, but mm-hmm. you say it's a grandson, you'll have a granddaughter coming up. Right. It'll be a totally different experience. That's right. Sure. It's going to be a different level of being broke. Right. Is what <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a granddad mm-hmm. to your grand, grandson right now, what is your favorite part currently um, being a granddad to your grandson? Uh, well, two things. One, be, getting the opportunity to be with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, my son and uh, daughter-in-law and my grandson live in Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And so we don't have a lot of opportunities uh, to be physically together. Uh, I, I think I'm very thankful for technology that, you know, FaceTime, FaceTime and everything. Yeah. Get to see, get to see him grow up uh, a lot more than I would otherwise. But uh, being with him, mm-hmm. it just, just – I mean, it's just amazing, and they, I've, I've heard a lot of grandparents say this. There's nothing like it. They're absolutely true. Mm-hmm. And, and the other part of it is uh, being a grandfather, what I enjoy is watching my son mm-hmm. be a good dad. Um, you know, you, you raise your, your children, and, and when they're in the teenage years, you really just don't know how they're going to turn out. But, uh, uh, you know, watching him be a, a good father – and a good husband is a, is an amazing thing. Now, is he in law enforcement as well? No, he's not. He's in education. He's a special education teacher. Okay. Okay. So watching the son be a good dad and a good husband, mm-hmm. um, that's one thing that I want to make sure that my mom, when she sees me, um, she's about to be a grandmother soon, mm-hmm. next month, right, actually. Right, right. Congrats. Um, I'm looking forward to showing her, Mom, this is what you raised. You raised right. a son who can take care of his wife right. and his child. Absolutely. Um, so I know, I'm sure the pride that you have for your mm-hmm. both of your children mm-hmm. um you're about to see your 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 daughter have a grandbaby girl no you're but it's my my son your son's right. okay so your daughter mm-hmm. had no okay, she so just your son's she, gonna have both right kids. she just okay. recently graduated from from school and she's uh in the animal okay uh world so son's about to be a dad to right. he's got a yeah, boy dad and he's about to be a girl dad right so, okay uh, right so it's a different <laughs> he's gonna have a different experience as well well he's got dad to kind of lean on be like hey all right dad you had my sister so <laughs> right, <talk to> me. <laughs> right. So, and it, i'm telling you it's completely different uh, well i'm i'm looking forward to it on my end just to be a dad um right. and it's just the excitement that i have mm-hmm. people may not see it but it's there oh and yeah i'm so looking forward to oh, it oh yeah um, so, Chief Corley, again, thank you for coming on mm-hmm. East Main 101 Lesson 13. Uh, and again, at some point we'll have you on. We'll go more deep into statistics of data and things like that. Sure. Um, so, uh, thank you all for joining us for East Main 101 Lesson 13. Uh, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media channels. Oh, I forgot that there is homework. Um, so, homework <laughs> for you all who are watching. I want you to visit our police department website, and the web link will be here on the screen. It's police.jacksontn.gov. Go there. Just browse through it. There is a a link for community engagement where you can be a part. There's a link to sign up for the camera registry Mm -hmm. system. Uh, Sign up for it. Read about all the things that's going on JPD. Get involved with JPD. We've got Neighborhood Watch, National Night Out, Citizens Police Academy. we got the Youth Police Academy that happens in the summer. Uh, get involved with JP. They are a community policing department. 
Um, we want to be in the community. Our police officers want to be in the community, get to know you all, get to know all of our citizens, business owners, church leaders. Check out JPD at police.jacksontn.gov. So that's your homework. Again, thank you for joining us for Lesson 13 of East Main 101. Don't forget to follow us on all of our social media channels. Subscribe to us. We're now on Apple Podcasts, so you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Again, thank you for joining us. And until next week, class business.